before we get started with our interview with John Little, we want to give you a couple updates and some information. Yeah, so obviously we talk a lot on the show uh, with people who we've met at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center at that puppetry conference. A couple of weeks back, they had a horrible flood in their pub, which is really kind of the epicenter of the whole conference. It's where people commune and really get to know each other. And uh, they're currently fundraising to rebuild uh, the that pub. As you can see, this is no small incident. So anything you can contribute would be greatly appreciated. And, and we want to make sure that it could be restored for people to enjoy this upcoming summer and and for the next you know many years. So if there's anything you could do to uh, to help Blue Jeans out, follow the link in the show notes and uh, and give what you can. And thank you so much to our friends who've already started backing us on Patreon. Every little bit that you guys can contribute helps us so much to be able to expand this show uh, beyond what you see now. Yeah, this is no small undertaking. So the anything you could do to help us out in making the best show possible, we'd really appreciate it. And even if you're not able to contribute financially at this time, even just sharing and promoting the show helps us a lot. Great. So, Adam, I think it's time for uh, some John Little on the 20th episode of Puppeteers. What do you think? All right. We're ready to go. Let's, Here is John Little. Let's roll it. That is the fun part of puppet building is that you never know what you're going to get. Are you going to be creating basically a, a a possessed toaster? Are you going to have to like make a toaster that can be puppeteered? Are you going to do little cockroaches like I see behind you? Because of the world of puppeteering, anything could become alive. You really never know what you're going to get. You have to be kind of ready for it. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger. And Cameron Garrity. And today we have the one and only John Little on today. Welcome Woo! to the show, John. Hey, fellas. How's it going, guys? Uh, it's so Thanks great to have me. you here. Absolutely. Welcome to episode 20 of Puppeteers. Uh, 20. 20. Woo! Yeah. Almost uh, old enough good. to drink. Exactly. That's <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing right now. Oh. Uh anyway uh but no J john little is a good friend of ours for for many years now uh he is a master craftsman puff builder owner of dancer um, a dancer owner creator of little's uh little's creatures and um you know we've we've known him for a long time we've wanted to have him on and um it's it's so good to have you here so john little welcome to puppet tears oh thank you very <laughs> much guys that's that's a wonderful warm welcome thank you so uh what what are you up to what What's new in the life of John Little? Uh, so I just performed last week. That was fun at a puppet slam here in Boston for the Brookline Puppet Show Place. And uh, cool. we're doing something new. We're, we're uh, Sarah Nolan, Harry Lacoste, and myself did a little improv segment uh, mm -hmm. about 10, 15 minutes just in part of the slam. Uh, and that's fun. I want to try and explore that a little more. A uh, couple of commissions working on working on a puppet for the web series stealing focus uh they're little broadway critic reviews a uh, fun little web series cool. um i built their original puppet and they came back now to have me build it again so it's a refurb but it's still fun so it's yeah. from scratch to bottom um and then a couple projects kind of in production trying to do some live streaming so working out a a puppet to do a whole bunch of mechs from eyes and everything to try and really get a lot of emotion in with just a head and yeah so that that's and a couple short films hopefully so things like that but uh what else is there oh and uh gonna be hopefully teaching a class in the fall for uh like a comedy puppet late night kind of thing so that's super cool. Awesome. That's now for the uh, the improv that you guys were doing at uh, at the Showplace Theater, was that like a, a audience like giving you suggestions or was it? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Yep. So we had a couple of improv games that we were kind of going with, and then uh, just took suggestions from the audience and ran with it. But so it's fun. fun. Were you changing up characters in between? Oh scenes? yeah, constantly, yeah. constantly. We had a i don't know 30 puppets sitting on the side there that we all three of us build uh -huh. and so we all had our menagerie of puppets ready to go and just kept changing it up and if you could see an easy joke where something was talking about someone hopped in with a pig or they hop in with yeah. a little guy i'm <laughs> sleeping and just lots and lots of little jokes everywhere so that's so much fun yeah i i'm doing a, i'm on our local comedy sports team uh doing usually just improv as myself but they do some puppet uh, the flesh versus felt shows every once in a while and it kills me because I can only do one puppet 
per show. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, but we've got such a like a cast that, you know, you just want to when the, the joke Absolutely. comes up, like, pull out the shark or whatever. So but that that must have been so much fun. And uh, you MC at the uh, show place every once in a while, too. Every right? once in a while I do. Yeah. No, I, I call it kind of a, a shenanigans. I'm more of a, <laughs> a heckler <laughs> or, a, but, or or distraction, if you will. But uh, yeah. uh, I haven't done it a little bit. But yeah, no, I used to do it a, a lot. A lot. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys That's use so cool. uh, monitors at all when you do that? Or is it just for the... We audience? did. We, we did it uh, with a camera and then projected it on the monitor. So we didn't hide the oh. puppeteers mm -hmm. at all. So you get the little view either thing you can watch the puppeteers yeah. working or you can watch what we would see on the on the monitor so cool. so much fun it is it's a it's a lot of fun it, it it all stemmed from the the idea that when sarah nolan moved up here to be the artist in residence at the puppet show place theater uh we had the idea that oh we can get together and start puppeteering more on camera and we started a uh a monthly gym jam session as we call it and anyone's welcome to come and they can just puppeteer with us on camera. It's really just an excuse for us to be able to practice and get better and push ourselves. Uh, but it's fun to have other people come in. And so from that, we were having a lot of fun and thought it might be nice to do some improv stuff too for audiences. That's cool. so cool. We'll have to go on the road one day. I know. Do a behind the sure. scenes look. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Nice. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and it, it's great for you know people just to have that community and build up. And it's so hard. You know, you could work on technical stuff as much as you want by yourself, but you know these characters really need to exist with other characters and to absolutely. And stuff. Yeah, so that's that's such a great thing that you guys have. Very it's fun. fun. It's fun. It's fun to push it, and we we do a whole series of different things from improv one week singing maybe a next to just moving around in the frame and really challenging ourselves to all right you're now in the back and you got to move to the front to left to back to right and really doing like a little tango of mm -hmm. moving around the screen and really pushing some of our skills and some of it's really hard but it's fun yeah. it's good yeah definitely so how many people would be up performing at once typically uh two three but we we can do even more than that we've done you know a whole big group choreography stuff too at the gym jam sessions but for for our actual audience stuff we've been doing just sarah harry and myself so so love to get back to the beginnings of john little oh and, man and, that's a long time ago deep. yeah well so i mean i was uh, you know i was thinking about it this morning i was like what, what are we going to talk to him about and for as long as i've known you you were just such a confident outgoing like funny support person. <laughs> and like have you has that always been that way like how how did how did this happen because it's just it's such a wonderful <laughs> thing to be around you and have you always been like that or is it something uh, you are too kind uh i don't know i i felt like i was shy for a while or uh, maybe not at home but when I hit college, I think I kind of really came out of my shell a little more and started yeah. to be a little more outgoing and able to just talk to giant masses of people and stuff. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it, it I, I don't know. Cause I, I, part of it, I think was that I was definitely a nerd. I was the nerd <laughs> in school and I was excluded. And part of that was because I did ballet. And so I was the only boy in the entire area that did ballet and I did jazz too. And that puts you on the outs immediately. And kids are like, Oh, you're different. And what are you doing? But I loved it. I had a lot of fun with it. It was great. I did that for years and years and years and years, uh, dancing with two different companies and then with Boston ballet, taking their classes and doing, uh, I did the production of, um, Oh, Sleeping Beauty on stage at the Wing Center here in, in Boston as a like 13, 14 year old. And and it was great. It was awesome, but it definitely puts you on the outs. Totally. And then if that wasn't enough, I also did Boy Scouts. So it also makes you like a <laughs> super nerd there too. And but I, I guess I just didn't care. It was just what I did. But right. uh I was talking with my wife about it. I think so. I didn't have that moment like Ronnie or Ryan dylan did where they kind of just that's it i'm doing puppetry i came into it a lot later and so i didn't do it as a 10 year old or 11 year old i i started later and it, but it, i looking at it i realized that everything was kind of gearing me up to where i am now like all those things i bring them all into my performances now into my building now 
it all makes sense. So now I know you did fine arts in college. Had you always been an artist as well as the dancer or was that something that also came later? Yeah, no, I, I did art all through high school and junior high and stuff and really pushed it. And, you know, so it was dancing and art and a lot of creative endeavors of things. And I went to a museum school of fine arts in Boston. And you went for art education, too. I went you? for art education. Yeah, okay. it was, so it was my art teacher, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I haven't used. Um, but uh, I, mean, I, I use it in my teaching classes now, but it, mm -hmm. it's it's hasn't been a, st a thing i was trying real hard after college to try and just make it in the art field that way and then kind of went along but um yeah so i guess a big turning point if you will in the aspect of puppetry which is this is about puppetry is when i got to college there was a group there called kaiju big battle and there was giant monster wrestling and I was, I'm a big guy. I'm six, three, I'm a very large person. And I, I had a, and they just like, we need you. We need to put you in this costume. And I was like, what was what going on? And, and really at like freshman year and started ending up in these giant suits and we were doing giant performances. And before I knew it, we we're performing for 5,000 people, um, in New York city. It's, it was crazy, but absolute whirlwind. Um, and then I guess from there, I did that for years, like eight, nine years. Uh, and then my, my wife, girlfriend at the time, took me to a puppet slam in Brookline Puppet Showplace Theater. And I would watch the, the Perry Alleys open the show. And then I think Evan O Television performed. And there's a couple of others that were okay. Uh, but it was one of those moments where I said, oh, I could do that. I should do that. Why don't I do that? And I just went home and started doing that. And it was, it's, it just took that stuff from Kaiju and things and made it all smaller and compact and started being able to just do my own thing. And it kind of went from there, I guess. Yeah. And the Kaiju must have been something that kind of bridged from your dancing, which is all about the movement and the, you know, what you're doing with your body is the tool. And then, you know, you, you just, like you said, you just make it smaller with the puppetry. Oh, absolutely. You know, Kaiju was absolutely easy stem from dancing. It was all body control. And it, it's, it's basically a, I didn't know it at the time, but I was basically doing puppetry at that moment because I was doing full body puppetry so we're yeah. putting on a big performance with these giant foam latex suits and you know doing everything from front flips and back flips to jumping off 10 foot high cages it, it really is if, if you don't know kaiju it's for anyone out there that doesn't know kaiju big battle it's a mix of wwf looney tunes and godzilla <laughs> wow, is how is how i would describe it it's very yeah. goofy and very funny I mean, we have wrestling bananas, and I, I used to play a character called Club Sandwich, which was a giant sandwich that was holding a club. Like, <laughs> like so, um, so it's absolutely stupid, goofy stuff. Is there any but, footage of this anywhere? Oh, there's I tons and tons. I gotta tons see this. Tons. Okay, we're gonna link that. Yeah, tons and sure. tons of footage. Yeah, I played, um, let's see. So, I played a lot of the taller, bigger characters, but I did, uh, Slowfang, which was a Swedish Viking werewolfy kind of thing. I did Moda Naru, who is a lava monster. He's actually kind of behind me right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, did Midori no Kaiju, it was a big Godzilla esque costume that we actually killed on stage. We chopped them into pieces on stage while I was in there. We had a whole blood pack squirting everywhere. And um, did Robox. So yeah, a whole mess of characters that we did. And that was the fun part is because we were in full suits and you couldn't see our faces, you'd perform two or three times during the night. You just keep changing costume and go back out and right. change and go back out and change and go back out. <laughs> but it's oh, it's fun. And, so and they're wild. still they're still doing shows. Um Rand Borden, uh Randy Borden created the whole thing and absolutely just a genius, loves the Godzilla stuff and uh but it was great it was all my college buddies it was all just people from museum school and it was one of those perfect blends of people that 
we had a guy that was unbelievable at editing video and special effects and that kind of thing. Uh, we had guys that were break dancers and former gymnasts and dancers. And it was all those art nerds that were a little bit of a jock too. Mm -hmm. And so we all could kind of combine that stuff together. Yeah. And it must've been kind of a refreshing turn. Cause I think you've talked about before, like you would have football coaches and stuff growing up say like, you gotta be on the football team. You're so tall and all this stuff. Oh yeah. And like, finally, you know, someone say, Oh my gosh, you're so tall. And it'd be the perfect marriage of all the things you're already interested in. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I did sports too in high school, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I did wrestling and track and cross country and stuff, but it's not, yeah, this, this was a, a perfect little form fitting thing. And I, I think at the time it was like, holy cow, like, is anything ever going to be bigger than this? Because we were getting on the cover of every paper and magazines and all those kinds of things from Newsweek to Boston Globe front covers. And so when we did a half hour specials with MTV, at like, you know, oh, I was wow. what, 23, 24. So, so it was pretty awesome. But. I, at one point, I definitely thought I was like, I'm going to die doing this. And not, not that I'm going to do it for so long that this will be my last job, but I'm going to die doing this because we're going to flip off of something and that's going to be it. So, <laughs> how big were those audiences? Uh, so we started out at like, you know, a couple of hundred and then got up to a thousand and two thousand. They were playing places like the Roseland Ballroom in New York and the Roxy. Um, and then we were a special guest of Philadelphia Comic Con, Boston Anime Con, and so huge, huge spaces. And yeah, it was fun. It was a really fun That's time. Cool. One of my best of my life. Kind of just unbelievable how it all kind of came together. No, so then when puppetry started and you had that moment of I I could do that, uh, was the Muppet style kind of the first thing you went to, or did you try table? What what was your first experience then with the smaller kind of puppets? Uh, so there was a lot of stuff. So I, you know, condensing foam. It, I was already working with foam with kaiju stuff, and so mm -hmm. some of that helped with like I'll use foams and start shrinking down. We did patterning and stuff with kaiju suits too. Uh, to an extent, um, but it really, kind of, uh, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes at the beginning trying to figure out how to condense things. And the first puppets were gross, really <laughs> ugly, ugly, horrible puppets. And mm -hmm. if anyone's listening, make those mistakes and learn from them and get better. But uh, I, I, I was lucky in that Paul Vincent, they had an incubator at the puppet show place theater where you could come in and sort of work on your projects and figure out good advice. And I have Paul Vincent Davis here, who's there's an unbelievable world-class puppeteer yeah. and gave me tons of advice of, you know, different building styles, different puppet styles. I had to do a real education. I had to catch up. I had to catch up to those rest of those people because I wasn't living in that world of puppets. I, I like the Muppets. I like, you know, I, I think we were more of a labyrinth and dark crystal house than really okay. a Muppet house. Uh, but, you know, they're all great. Um, but really, I had to catch up. I had to catch up on my history. I had to catch up on my building styles. And for, gosh, four years, I did every single Puppet Slam at the Puppet Show Place Theater. So, you know, every two months. And I had I created a new piece for every single one of them. And I did it all styles from shadow puppets to tabletop puppets to you know you name it it was all just to catch up and see what works with audiences and what doesn't work and etc so yeah i mean because i think a lot of times and i i know i'm guilty of this at times you you lock into one style and you just want to work on that and refine it and i think you took such a great approach of really trying to to create that spectrum for yourself. So you've got a, a wide array of, of skills and it's not just a, you know, one foot wide, 10 feet deep hole that you dug yourself into. Like that's, that's I think really important for, for puppeteers to, for uh, of anyone, but especially if you were trying to, to, to catch up, like you said, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and I mean, on top of performing all the, at all the slams i was also constantly filming and working with two of my good buddies from college uh stephen bailey and hakeem reed and every friday night we would get together and film for three or four hours just 
to whatever. It didn't matter what it was, just kind of just getting the hang of monitor techniques and really trying to do that. And you look back, they're horrible, but it, it was what they needed to build up that foundation of skills. What, what, um, as far as puppet building wise, what, uh, did you start off just doing it from a standpoint of necessity of needing puppets? And then clearly you fell in love with it as well. Uh, yeah. So definitely you need puppets to perform with puppets. So it was that start. And, uh, but I, I, you know, on top of the performing of dance and kaiju kind of stuff, I, I was, a, I did sculpture and drawing and video and painting and all the stuff in art school. So the sculpture techniques, I think, came in. And I kind of have it a, I don't know if it's a, a visual eye, but I, I wanted that visual thing, too, to also look nice. So I did a lot of stuff with that way. So, um, and it was one of those things, too, that the same way that I wanted to push myself as much as I could, anybody and everybody that wanted a puppet, I would build it for whatever price at the beginning. Like, it was... You know, I think the first puppet I sold was to my wife's boss. She was like, wait, your husband's making puppets. I'll take one for my kid and whatever. It's like, all right, fine, done. 20 bucks. Give me 20 bucks. I'll do it. And it's just everybody and anything just help pay for materials and get those first puppets out there. Because if you can sell your early stuff and just bank off those learning experiences, it's great. So Yeah, yeah and then to not have to see them in their workshop ever yeah. again either. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. But but I, I'm a an avid learner. So I, I, I am a, a giant sponge. So once I got really into the puppet thing, I was reading every book I could from the library and checking them out from the library network of like, give me every puppet book you could digging through those constantly watching every single video there was on YouTube from everything from Leo, like little eyes. If you know those, I love yeah, those. Yeah, yeah. Um, to Micropodium, the guy has a little tiny accordion player. Mm -hmm. You name it. If it was out there, I watched it on YouTube. But the, the Swazzle guys, they, they had a whole, you guys had them on, the whole mm -hmm. building series they had on some of these little puppets helped me a ton at the beginning. And uh, and then you just started making mistakes and figuring it out, I guess, But at some point. But um, I think, I think, I don't know. Go, go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I, I was just like, was that, um, at, at that point, was it like really just kind of a hobby or like at what point did it then become like, I'm going to just do this all the time? Uh, so I was pushing it pretty hard and then people started giving us some bigger projects. So mm -hmm. I, I got a, we did a curious kitchen TV pilot, uh, where we had this little stuffy French shift puppet and, uh, he was really snarky and it was fun. And my brother worked the hands for me. And then uh, I was doing the head talking and we had him cooking and tossing eggs around and all that kind of thing. And, and that was the real first taste of like, Ooh, this could be a thing. This could be something we could really do. Yeah. Um, and right around that time I went to the puppet fest, puppeteers of America festival in, okay. in Maryland. And I think, yeah, Maryland. And I, I performed at the late night puppet slam there with a puppet. I had a crude little uh, eyebrow mech on my puppet. And after the show, Fred Thompson came up to me. I had never met him before. And he's, he was telling me, he's like, that was pretty good. I kind of liked what you did in there. And uh, he's like, you should go to the O'Neill. And that that's, and he, he really pushed me and kind of scoop me under his wing a little bit it's like no no you gotta go meet jim krupa and you gotta he's, he'll help you with these imex and you'll figure out it'll change your life and it did it the o'neill completely put you know you talk about building so i got to a point where i don't think i could have got much higher without something like the o'neill to to put me in the right contact with people to really push that so well, for sure. I mean, it certainly has, you know, totally changed our lives as well. And and now for you, you're now the the master craftsman there and running the shop. That must be <laughs> like just totally surreal for you. How, now, how many... uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go, no, no. Go ahead, Adam. No, I was gonna say how many uh, how how many times did you go as a participant? So I think my first year at the O'Neill was 2009 as a participant, and then and I did. Uh, I worked with Krupa, and then I did uh, Marty Robinson's uh, video, uh, Puppet Anarchy. So not video, but the regular Puppet Anarchy. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I live, it's sort of going back to you talking about a gregarious person is that I, I, I have three ways I like to do my work is that I push myself really hard and I try and get all my due dates. I try and really push that stuff, like make everything on time. Uh, I'm always trying to strive for something better. And then the last thing is I always do with a positive attitude. Uh, always, always. And, and, it, and it goes really far. When you're on set for 10 hours of the day and you're still the happy guy at the end of the day, people are very happy to work next to you and around you. And at least I, I found that is. Um, so, so at the O'Neill, I did the same thing. I was working on my own project really hard. And if other people that maybe weren't as tool savvy were struggling, I was just helping them. I wasn't the assistant. I was just helping to help because that's what you do. And uh, Fred asked me the following year, he's like, hey, you know, there's a spot if you want to help assist Jim Krupa this this coming year. I was like, I'll do that. Absolutely. Why not? Why would I not do that? And so, uh, and that created a great relationship with Jim. So, and, and you know, Fred's just my hero. He's awesome. But, uh, and so helping Jim year after, and then I helped Jim for, oh man. I've been helping him since then. I guess since 2009, I've been his assistant every year, uh, helping with the the mech workshop, which is great because I help him and then I build basically help assist with 20 different mech puppets. So you really get the hang of the mechanisms in mm -hmm. that. So I think I still have from my my first O'Neill, which would have been 2012, uh, you explaining in the pub how the little insect puppet worked. You were <laughs> you were talking through it was the last night of the pre-conference and you were like, you do this and this and this and this and this. And um and I remember you surprising yourself of like, holy cow, I can't believe I like remembered all that just by like just saying it. And um yeah, it, it was so cool of like just you you it must be a great learning experience for you, even though you're assisting Jim, like that you're really you're learning that mech at the same time and oh yeah, yeah. internalizing yep. it. Yeah, well, it's, so Jim's cool. brilliant in that I mean, he really is a genius with that stuff and that uh, everything is standardized. Every, once you've figured out the Jim Krupa formula, and it might take you a little bit, you might have to do some more building on your home, at, at home with it. But once you've got it, you got it. It's okay. That's always going to be that drill bit before I tap it with a 440. That's always going to be this. So we always use the Dura colors. We're using all these things. And I see Adam nodding. He's like, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that's right. Uh, <laughs> so <face> lasers over, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, 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 it's, it looks extremely complicated from the outside. But once you've kind of got into those internal workings, the mechs are actually simple. Like Jim talks about, they really are just a spring and a string. It's just how you attach it and make it turn. Yeah. So I, I remember, uh, he, he, constantly say like half of what you'll take away from this class is like the list of materials once mm -hmm. you have that that's kind of half of half of the battle as far as standardizing the way that he does well and, and that's one of the things that jim really helped me with with building my own puppets was turning me on to different materials he's like oh this is great john but maybe you should think about this for that and maybe you should think about this and mm -hmm. and you, like he put me on to uh uh, heat shrink tubing, and I, I really love heat shrink tubing now for arm rods and stuff, but or other parts even for putting them for mechanisms, keeping all the cables together. It's great. So, well, you know what? This is just a good time because you you mentioned arm rods, and I wanted to. <laughs> oh, oh no, <laughs> oh no. So we're gonna um... get into this. Huh? Oh boy. Oh, you bet. Um, wait, wait, so... Should we start off? I got a message from John Little after I made a video about arm rods. <laughs> A couple years ago, the, is that the, what we're talking no, about? Well, I was I was just going to answer the question that I have like in big letters on my on my card here is uh, John Little. Why is Adam Kurtinger wrong about arm rods? <laughs> oh man! All right, so you don't you don't offend your host, right? No. You don't offend your host. Uh, but really, that racist is all going out the window. <laughs> but 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 so no. the fact that Adam and I both do arm rods completely differently. Is actually one of the things I do love about puppetry and that there's a, a hundred different ways to skin the cat, if you will. Right. Yeah. And that everyone is doing it slightly different, but to get the same result result. I only have one yeah. more thing of that. Because because one thing too is even even the way like the videos and it, really any learning video on YouTube is kind of uh, framed as how to do this, you know, which kind mm -hmm. of kind of I guess inherently implies that this is the way to do it, when really they should almost be uh, called, you know, here's one way to do it. 
So yeah, keep no, in, absolutely. In, in mind, it's a ph- more of a philosophy rather than a an exact step by step direction. But I, go on. <laughs> well, no, so so you should go watch Adam's video. It's a great yeah. building video. <laughs> All his building videos are wonderful. Uh, but he drills that hole, and then you cut your grooves into your arm rod, and you. Do you resin them in? What's the material? Uh, yeah, I usually use uh, resin. Yeah. A resin. To, yeah. in a that's great. But I feel like that's too many materials for me. And, and that I feel like even no matter what kind of material you're going to use, it's going to eventually pull out or turn or it's going to wear out and unplug. So what I like to do uh, here, hold on. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but there's a little arm rod, a little handle. And so I drill a hole at the top or at what would be the bottom and then i cut a little channel into the the body of it there and then for those listening in their car this is a good moment to to go to the youtube video and and uh, always watch it on video always watch the video (laughs) but you know and then you can you just plug into uh let's see so so i a little angle i don't know if you guys can see that but a little Mm -hmm. angle there and that just goes into the hole and then you're good. And then you put it like a tape around here and it won't, it always will be connected. Can't ever. And now I use, it's so cheap to make it instead of having to do glue and wait for the glue to dry and everything. I can make these in five minutes. So I don't know, but that, like, but whatever, what I would argue is though, there's no wrong answers. There's no wrong answer. Every, except for the one you just gave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're right. I, I know that that is more of the industry standard. You know, I think yeah. a lot of them are done that way. Um, but, uh, cause I've, I've tried many other ways as well. And to be honest for, for me, it's so much faster just to drill a hole. And at the end of the day, a channel is kind of just like a hole. It's like a channel that's just like mm-hmm. over, you know, three quarters. Yeah. yeah. Of Absolutely. Um, uh, so the only thing you really do lose is that small little bend at the bottom, which uh, one thing is like when I first started doing it, I did just glue the rod straight into the hole and, and I did have one pull out before. But as long as you're using epoxy, if you're using hot glue, you're doing it wrong. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. But as long as if you cut those grooves in there, it bites into it. And, and, I, and I, I like that. I've I, never had a problem with it. But yeah, I you think... know, because on one end, because I understand to you, you like um, it's so much faster and less steps to do it your way. But uh, I guess what, what I'll be honest is the reason why I think it's faster for me because I can drill a hole so easily in epoxy is that secures in five minutes. Whereas, like, I've had a heck of a time trying to carve a channel into the side of a dowel. <laughs> I've tried it many times. I've tried using a Dremel. I've tried, like, holding it sideways to the um, bandsaw. And, mm-hmm. like, have I ever done it? Yes. But it was some of the most scary, most scary uh, <laughs> use of tools I've ever had in my life. And, like, I'm like, I'm just going to get my drill. <laughs> Epoxy, done. <laughs> hey, whatever works for you, man. I, I, I'm all for people experimenting because I think there's probably the, the next biggest awesome puppet building thing hasn't been found yet, right? If someone's right. going to do it by accident and it's going to be like change everybody else's perspective. So, um, soon but, we won't even use rods. We'll be controlling the arms through Wi-Fi or something right? in the future. Well, 3D printed I, arm rods. I, I love doing inside arm rods too. I don't know if you guys yeah, have played yeah. much of that, but I, I always, I always think that's magic when you see it on camera. And I've done that with a couple of puppets where you, you wire the whole arm up inside and then you can just maneuver it from the bottom and oh i love that way yeah. too yeah. yeah we just did that uh i think for white rabbit we did that right we might have i think it's the only time we ever did that yeah, yeah that, ideally it's better ago. for like shorter arms i know mm-hmm. um, yeah no i know i've tried some of yours that you've done that with and it's it's such a nice little yeah. technique uh, I, I I used it for a couple of puppets. I wanted to have really be like a dancing puppy I had. Mm-hmm. So I really had that like yeah, nice little like jazz that. hand back and forth kind of mm-hmm. thing. And it works really nicely for that. Super cute. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you've worked really well, I think, in sort of creating a business for yourself. And mm-hmm. and really, you know, you've got a, a defined brand and, and you've, as you've said, worked with a lot of really great clients. But can you talk about some of the lessons you've learned? And because I'm sure that took a while for you to to find your place and to you. I'm sure in the same way you made mistakes in building puppets, you probably made some 
you know, she was those arm rods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, but, it's dropped. It's dropped. Yeah. But uh, but made mistakes along the way. Can can you talk about some of the lessons learned that you know have sort of formed your philosophy in in running little creatures now? Uh, s- specifics are very important when dealing with a client. So anyone out there that wants to build pe- puppets for other people, make sure you get your due date very clear in writing. Make sure you really get every little detail specific that you can about what you they want and what you want out of this puppet um it probably always takes longer than you think it's gonna take uh right right adam yeah (laughs) i I feel like you could and and start timing yourself i think a really good idea is start if you're especially if you're a young builder coming up start timing yourself and see how actually long it takes and then divide that by the number by the amount that you were so if it's you know if you're saying you're paying a thousand dollars for the puppet divide that by your 40 hours and look at how much you're actually making and you probably say maybe i should be charging a little more for these puppets and uh right yeah so especially once you on top of the building materials and everything else uh one of the things i got from that that i like to do is i always order double what i think i need and then you end up so that if you do mess it up, you don't have to wait for a whole nother order to come in. So say something messed up or whatever, if you only ordered just what you needed, then you're just totally out of luck and have to wait for a whole nother. Now you lost the days for the shipping and everything else. But if you do it right the first time, now that's extra stock you have for when someone comes into you with a rush fee, or like a rush order, and they want the puppet in a week, you say, well, I can do it with this and this and this because you had those extra materials because you've been ordering double and you just work it into your cost. And so, yeah, I, I, that helps for me a lot for when you get the one that needs to be turned over really fast. Right. That's got to be great, too. Like, for for instance, what you're saying that you're working on right now, where you have you have to make a, a second puppet or refurbish or um, and then you automatically have those old materials from like a, I, I, I'm using the ex- I'm still using the exact same fur that I used the first time yeah. and, and and it's important because uh, dye baths change colors change and so you need to have those stuff I, I, I've built a, a bunch of puppets for the yeti.com uh, their t-shirt yeah. company uh, really fun guys and they're, they're, they are the ideal uh, client, if you will. It's what I wish every client was in that they pay in full and I send them stuff and they say, we trust you. You're the puppet guy. Like we yeah. just uh, like, and you know, let, let us do what we do. I, I promise I'm going to make you the best thing I can for you. And then they say, "Yo, you finish it when you finish it for the most part. <laughs> and, and, and it's awesome. It's the, they're, they're absolutely dreams. And so I built them a whole bunch of puppets. But when I dyed their first, uh, they had a special color of Antron fleece that they needed, like this kind of lightish blue to match the logo. Uh, I dyed a whole ton of it at the same time. And so I have a whole bunch. I'm still using, whenever they have another one, I'm still using the same Antron fleece, which is so much easier than trying to match it again. And oh, yeah, I mean, totally. I make notes to do that, but it's, it's so much harder. It's so much harder to match. Yeah. So Eye bats can really just, uh, it's so much can affect it. That it's mm-hmm. just, yeah that's right. why but most i can i try to order it from like puppet pelts or something just because it's it's such a pain but i always that, have that's some a, white that's amazing too puppet pelts is amazing i wish i had been around when i was first getting going but i guess because it wasn't i learned a lot about dyeing fabric and the temperatures and all those and the mixings of stuff but that is such a great resource for everybody oh, yeah. now and i know it's, i know uh, it, it may seem a little bit more expensive for a certain color or something at first it's cheaper maybe to get it white and then dye it yourself but uh you know what sometimes it's just not worth the headache and then like you said especially if you're building for a client that needs a specific color you don't have to mess around with it and work it into your costs like you mm-hmm. said absolutely no that, that, that's what it comes down to it's just you got to plan it out. You got to do all that homework and yeah. really make it out. But yeah, and you're saving yourself the time too. Oh like, my gosh, you, know, yeah. mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about dye bath and drying mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I did. I wanted to talk to you about the, that Yeti client because I remember you've you've talked about it over the years. <laughs> and um, no, it, what seems great about them is that you guys have also worked out a bit of an arrangement um, where they might not have the budget necessarily to do a full bodied costume, but I think you've worked something out where like you, you built a head for them one year and then like hands yeah. and other. So like, I, I think that's, 
I, sometimes people will will a company will ask for a really big ask, uh, you know, and they say, oh, but we only have. I'm just throwing out a number, but we only have $500 to do it. And you as a puppet builder say like, well, we can't do that. And sometimes that for some people might be the end of the conversation, but mm -hmm. you, you really were able to listen to the client and explain to them the process. Um, can you just talk about like why that's important and how that's benefited you? Uh, yeah. So for, for those guys, uh, what what it actually what happened, but I, I think this is a good point is that it's always willing to negotiate, always talk about stuff. Like for me personally, I want to give you something awesome. I want to, but I also have to feed my kids. So <laughs> it, it's that delicate balance of like when I'm working here, it's time away from my family. It's 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 so it's you gotta make it worth your while, I guess. Uh but I you know, if I could, I would work for free for everybody, right? But this yeah. isn't a isn't a thing you can do. <laughs> so the Yeti guys that that what happened was we had built them uh, gloves so they could have it folding T-shirts because they are a T-shirt company. So we built big arm sleeves first, so just giant, so they could play video games with it. They can uh, fold T-shirts. They can toss things around, and it was really fun. It was kind of just a way to cut in shots. And then while they had those, they realized like. Oh man, you know what we need now is a giant head, and so, <laughs> so, so because the arms are so, I made the arms really extra long. So they went all the way up to almost the shoulder on me. So they're they're plenty long for whoever wanted to wear them. Right. And uh, and so they realized that if they wore the t-shirt, they could tuck the arm up and wear their branded t-shirts, and then they also just shove this head on, and now they have a a great mascot mm -hmm. for, for conventions and whatever. So. That was fun. It was a fun build. The, yeah. the the tricky one on that was that we had... So most mascot puppets have some kind of open mouth thing so you can see out through the mouth for most puppets. That one has a very closed mouth of the uh, uh, underbite. And that made it extremely hard to see <laughs> well, where are we are going to have the puppet? Where are they, how are they going to see out? And so... It actually the eyeball if you look at the picture is um you see the white for the main eyeball and then there's a black pupil and that pupil is actually cut out and sunglasses are behind it right so the sunglass material is glued in there and so you see out through the sunglasses but because it's darker the inside you can't see and it works great so you're actually seeing right out through the eyes yeah and that must have just been a nightmare i mean because pupil placement you know, typically, if it's something yeah. you want to do last. If you're drilling a hole for it, you're committing. <laughs> right? Oh, I basically, I basically had to build the whole head, put the eyes on, figure out where they were, and then deconstruct the head yeah. to then drill it out and make it like a perfect hole cut. Like, which is also a, a tricky thing too. So you had to use the hole saws, and you're doing the make it all perfect, perfect. Because if you and I messed up a bunch of them on the way, you're like, oh, this is not perfectly symmetrical round or it's a little ovally or whatever and it's yeah. like i'll just throw it away throw it away throw it away oh. and they're not cheap they're all those engineering the ema oh yeah eyes. Right. so um yeah, depending on the size it may have been like what four or five dollars oh they're, they're big man they're yeah. they're i don't know but, oh geez like, yeah. yeah so not cheap crazy <laughs> now uh i i can't remember was that something that um you know because because this whole thing is just you know borrowing techniques and learning from other people was that something that you picked up from jim was that was oh that yeah after the howdy oh yeah show? that was i, I remember I, I was building it right around the same time as the howdy do show is about to happen so we'd done mm -hmm. some test fittings for the grandpa jimbo and uh and he had sunglasses in those eyes too. And I was like, that's brilliant. I'm going to yeah. use that. I'm going to steal that as, as Krupa says. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the good way of like, Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to steal that. That's, that's where it's saving memory mm -hmm. memorizing. So yeah, it was, it was definitely that same totally from Jim. That's so cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's always so great when, um, you know, when you're able to take something from him and then every once in a while, you know, he learned something from some of his students and it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's not me, class. but <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> yeah. It was, I, I brought in a puppet that, that Max character and he was fascinated by the tail and how the tail moved by itself. And he's like, Oh, that's great. He's like, I want to steal that. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I stole that too. I think, I, I think the fraggles were like that. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, you came up with it. You're, 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 I'm like, I really don't think so, buddy, <laughs> but go ahead, do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No. And, and and that how do you do show was like you talk oh, about yeah. awesome things. That was one of the best things ever. And 
just so fun. Adam worked on that, and that, oh, that was one of the best times ever. You were the star yeah. of the show. <laughs> I, I was half of the star, I would yeah, say. Right. So you got right. to use all your puppetry and dancing skills yeah. all in one big uh, extravaganza. Did, 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 I don't know if you guys ever heard about how that happened. That I actually ended up in the suit. Is I don't that think I did either? No. So, so we're working on the Time Machine Guitar TV pilot, where Pam Marciero, uh, Jonesy, and uh, Jim Krupa were all in there as the three main puppeteers. And I built all the puppets for the show, which was absolutely neurotic to me that I said, you have Jim Krupa on your show. Why am I building these puppets? You have Jim Krupa on the show. Why am I building these? Absolutely horrifying. And it was an, an impossible deadline. But for the TV pilot, we did it in two weeks. I built all three main characters in oh two weeks from God. beginning to end. And they had to be there at the end of that two weeks. So had to, so they didn't even have two weeks. They had to ship them on top of it overnight. And the whole, it was, it was crazy, impossible deadline. But when we went to uh, to oh, where I forget where we're down south shooting the the show, and we were all hanging out for a week, and so we're out getting dinner and everything. And some guy was playing music on the street, and I was like, "Oh, this is good music. I'm gonna jam to this and just kind of <laughs> having fun, and just busting out moves like you know moonwalking and gliding and whatever I was doing, just having fun." A normal day for John. A Lowe. normal day. <laughs> you know, it's just cursed by a gypsy, have to dance. Uh, so Jim told me later, he's like, that's it. He's like, that was the moment. He said, I saw you move and I'd heard you say you were a dancer and everything. He's like, oh, come on, man. The dude's huge. He can't really move, right? He's an enormous guy. And he's like, oh, I'm using that someday. I'm using that. And so that's why I ended up in Grandpa Jimbo is because he saw me dancing so yeah. for that, that it, was, it was fun it was yes. fun what was the, one of your favorite uh parts about uh working on that show how do you do show yeah. uh or time machine guitar which one uh, the, the how do you do show how do you do show so the how do you do show i think i had a lot of fun just working out the script with jim we had a lot of fun kind of just planning it out and had it, it felt really much like a i mean i was an assistant for it but i it felt like wow this is this is cool this is the the show like this is it felt really big and awesome we had a big ensemble what do we have 14 people yeah, we had a ton. Yeah, yeah. and a million puppets that he had built and from little cows to yodeling birds to everything and it was just it was fun because i got to you know with, with jim's help of course but we were kind of casting people and trying to think of everyone's strengths and weaknesses and make sure everyone had a, a part that they were really happy with and and then still have it be the best image we could. But Jim and I had a lot of time where we were just sitting, just the two of us talking things out. And that was really great. Like just, okay, yeah, they're doing this. And we take notes and we were thinking about things. And, and we worked on a lot of the choreography for grandpa Jimbo. Cause I was in the suit, but then Jim Krupa was on the second floor of the space with a remote Waldo kind of remote control thing to work the mouth and the hat so the hat would go to like change the expressions and sort of like almost like an eyebrow lift or a, a angry frown and then he would work the jaw which was crazy for me inside because all i heard was <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could barely hear the audio at all uh so i had to really know my part and know that oh i'm gonna be going over this way and selling it over there and it was all um but i yeah, it, I don't know. There were so many little wonderful moments of that show. I, I liked the very end, towards the end of the week while we were figuring out the whole show, we realized that everyone should have an individual handshake or like little bow moment with Grandpa Jimbo. And so every two set of puppeteers that came out had to do a different little dance with Grandpa Jimbo. <laughs> so <laughs> doing a, like a, a Watusi with one person. We're doing like chest bumps, I think, with Adam. And you do like special crazy high fives. Another. Oh, it was such a blast. Such a blast. We all became really tight with that group, too. We came uh, We named ourselves the, the Croupies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was Absolutely. Cool. I think the – so, as you know, every once in a while, the, the – the lenses inside would fog up too. So sometimes you're working basically completely blind oh as you're running around <laughs> this giant suit. <laughs> and and it was huge because I'm six three. And then the hat added tons. So it must have been like almost seven feet tall from like foot to top. Cause the head just made my head even bigger. And then I was wearing a 
like four X or I don't know something shirt that that uh, my arm. I'm a big wingspan, so my arms fit fine. And then we fluffed out the body, and the pants were the largest pants I think Jim could buy. I forget the the radius. It was basically like a they hula were... hoop around me. <laughs> yeah, it was a great like Weight Watchers photo oh, of it... you like holding up oh, the oh, jeans. Nice. Man, I put that. I put so I put up a photo of me like holding because I thought it'd be funny, <laughs> like the Weight Watchers thing. Uh-huh. And a bunch of people I hadn't seen in a while commented, they're like, way to go, John. I was like, you thought I was that big? <laughs> you thought I was that big at some point? That oh, big? My oh God. come uh-huh. on. <laughs> oh, jeez. Like four or 500 pounds. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, my God. That's Goodness. too funny. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, why don't we go back over to the Time Machine guitar, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, talk a little sure. bit more about that process and... Uh, Obviously, you had a crazy build for that, but I imagine the oh, shoot, shooting was also uh, equally as tight, I'm guessing. So we, we shot the whole pilot in about four days. Uh, so I think there was like a, a prep day and then basically the rest was just shooting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was awesome. We had a, a great time on set. They had a good team down there, did it all. And the premise, if anyone doesn't know, is basically – uh, it was created by Ralph Covert, who is a Ralph's World, so he's a children's musician. And he finds a guitar, and they play the guitar, and then they go back in time. So it was very much so like Bill and Ted's like kids show, <laughs> if you will, in a in a big treehouse. We had a dog, we had a cat, and we had a squirrel. So, and then uh, they had little kids play the historical figures in the TV pilot, which was great. Oh, cute. And then. Uh, Oh man, I think it was a year. He was pitching it around to people and then he got some money to put the show on. We were hoping to do it as a whole TV show, but then I think it got, I don't know why, but it got brought down to more of a web series. Uh, and so for, for when he went, wanted to go for the next round, we actually, I built all the puppets again uh, and did made some changes and we, we added. So the original ones were just like a, a terry cloth because uh, mm-hmm. they wanted to kind of, make them a little bit different from Muppets and change it up. And then when we did the rebuild, I did them all out of fur. So they're like a nice short nap fur and it looks, they look great. Um, but then we also did the huge undertaking of, we had all the, instead of kids as the historical figures, they wanted puppets as the historical figures. So I built all of these anything style puppets where you could change the features up and make it Martin Luther King and Josephine Baker and Christopher Columbus. And so all these historical figures through time, which the facial features and stuff were fine. And then I brought in uh, Katie Treadway, uh, who's a amazing fashion puppet person. Uh, and she did Amelia Earhart's jacket for me and some of the really fine tuned, like historical dress. And was, she was amazing. So, but, uh, I think in Noah Genix is puppeteering them now, I think in Chicago oh, for the web series stuff. So, but I, I don't know what his plan is right now, but for right now, it's kind of, I think in a holding pattern. So, yeah. but yeah, that that's definitely one of those projects that, um, you know, it seems like such a labor of love for everyone involved and, you know, slowly, but surely it, it, you know, hopefully will be happening and, and taken off. Cause I think it, I it's think a, when it's I, fun. Yeah. And I think when I first met you guys in 2012, you had just shot the pilot. Maybe. Yeah, that sounds that sounds right. That yeah. sounds right. Yeah, and and that was great. That brought me a lot. Like, so it was one thing working at the O'Neill with them, and it was another be able to work in this nice professional setting with Krupa and and Pam Marciero and and Jonesy I'd known forever, but <laughs> but to work especially with Krupa and Pam to be able to work on that project with them and be more of an equal instead of just a student mentory kind of situation was great. Now, the, something else I wanted to talk to you about, because you've talked a lot about building um, either original characters of yours or characters for um, other other people who are creating their own work. But you've also done work on, um, I know for sure, Hand to God and Avenue. Mm-hmm. You, did you also build a set of um, Little Shop of Horror plants or did you just do a, a pod <laughs> one? Uh, I know you got the. I, I know you have at least one Audrey too. <laughs> it's pod two, buddy. Pod two, pod, two. pod two. Sorry. Pod two. Uh, so yeah. So for Avenue Q, I was just brought on as a a coach to kind of get them uh, up to speed, okay. manipulation style. Yeah. And then the amazing Roxy Myram, who is the artistic director at the Puppet Show Place, came in to do the day to day kind of puppet directing with mm-hmm. them. 
on the Avenue Q. And we did that for the lyric stage in Boston, but I, I didn't build. They had rented a set oh, from somewhere. Got it. Uh, and then we had talked about, it, but I think my budget and their budget were a little far away from each other. Uh, but it was still great. It was a really fun project, and they they did a great job with that show. And then uh, Roxy Myram was brought on for the Hand of God show as the as a kind of puppet coach, puppet director. And she said, "Well, you have to get John for this project. He's he's the the guy that's going to build this." And uh, we took a nice, fun, different approach in that the director uh, didn't want to see any of the materials from the original Broadway Hand of God. He's like, "I I have my ideas of what I'm reading for the script. He want just from the script." And so he came in with just a basic gym sock with some buttons on it. He's like, I want something like this. And so I just took that and bought a whole bunch of gym socks and ran with it from there and drew some patterns out. But I think, uh, so, but he really wanted grungy. So I had to make them look dirty and beat up and everything, but they had to also be iron rock clad inside to be able to work nicely every day, but then still also look kind of, grungy uh yeah. I, th I think the big thing i added to that show uh from a building perspective that i really loved was i added a live hand to the last version of tyrone oh, cool so when they're performing he actually could strangle people for real and he could throw things in the air and he could throw things across the room and it made a really fun change to that piece instead of just uh, and we took all the arm rods away because the puppeteers, you know, it's hard. It takes a long time to learn arm rods. So we took all the arm rods away. And we were able to use it with hands. And the, it made it fun for the fight choreography. So other people would grab the arms and, like, struggling oh, with oh, the little yeah. arms. <laughs> and you have a lot of different tension. Um, but it, 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 that was a great show. A lot of difficult things to learn. We had to deal with blood packs. And the puppets got covered with blood every night <laughs> and to have that be able to come out every day is tricky. It was, right. it was, yeah. Yeah. And that must have been part of like just the R and D component for you of like figuring out how are we going to do this and not stain, stain the puppets. They, they gave stuff. me a big sample of the, the blood. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I had this little Ziploc baggie, if you will, of um, fake blood in my shop, which looked really gross just to have in a big bag. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would sit there and I would dip the fabric in and dip it out and see, did that work? No, nope, that's out. Try this one. Okay, this one's no good. I ended up using Scotch Guard and uh, the extreme Scotch Guard mm -hmm. stuff. So if anyone needs that, a couple of coats of it and anything will wipe off of it. So it was great. And these were white puppets. So on top of it, it's one thing to do with like a darker color fleece, but this is like basically a white gym sock. And to make it <laughs> have that blood pattern come off was so hard. And their socks are designed to absorb too. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, but, but that was fun because usually I get paid to build a lot of really cute things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and the more, part of the reason I build a lot of TV puppets is because pe that's what people want. That's what people want to, Pay me for it. So people and and it's great. I wish more people wanted tabletop puppets. I build tabletop puppets for everybody. Mm. Um, but so that show is really fun. I was like, I get to go as creepy as I want to go. Absolutely as creepy as, and as I want to go. And the puppets got bigger as they went too. So it was like started with a little sock puppet, and then they got bigger and bigger. So it was a slow transition. I think we had five really? different versions through the yeah. show. Right. And uh, and the last one was big. The last one was really a big foam body and had like intense look to them. And we, we, uh, use a lot of voodoo and like symbols of the devil with like snakes and vampires or bats and different things that Roxy Myron had brought into the table. And man, it, it that was, a, that was a fun show, crazy show, but fun for sure. No. And I, what I loved about those two, um, was that it still, even though it was kind of different from what you're used to making, it still very much had like the essence of like a John Little design, which was really, mm -hmm. you know, nice to see you be able to, you know, leave your, leave your fingerprints on it a little bit. It, um, it was, I still will never forget the, there was an audible gasp from the audience at the opening of the second act when the puppet reached through with his hand, because he had the live hand, mm. and they had sort of a, a stage inside of a stage. So he had his own curtain that he opened, and so he reached through and poked through and just like 
ha ha and like oh they're like oh oh this is on now this is like and and we we worked his hair into so he had this little black tufts of hair and they became the horns so like the horns that came oh, became from the hair right. and stuff like that so it's all very subtle adapting throughout and yeah it yeah, was fun. So cool. I mean, you know, I'm so glad that they that they reached out to you know a, a professional puppet builder too, because I know uh, I've worked with a ton of theaters, and they're always trying to cut costs and try to do as much as they can there themselves. It's the name of the business, really, and um, but and especially for a puppet that's supposed to kind of look handmade, you know, they're mm-hmm. like, why, you know, why don't we just do this ourselves? But there's so much value in bringing in. A per, uh, you know, a, a puppet builder, because you know, uh, you have to have that experience of performing and stuff to really know how to build one just right that'll also last. Oh yeah, and, and like, so it's really funny. So it was stitched thoroughly, hand stitched with like double stitched, you know, heavy duty thread and all this kind of stuff. But then I went through and did fake bad stitching yeah. on top yeah. of it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's so what that, I do with mine too. <laughs> so uh, it's it's it looks like it has this horrible stitching, but it's actually really impeccably stitched underneath. But it's just a fake out of to make it work. Yeah, yeah. that's great. <laughs> I I saw that my my uh, my college mounted that production a year or two ago, and uh, I went just to support because I knew some of the the people in it. <laughs> they were literally using number two pencils for the arm rods, <laughs> oh which like God. snapped midway through. I think I think you literally saw like someone cut their hand on. The oh man, or whatever. It's it so <laughs> cringeworthy. But <laughs> well, you see that with uh, you know, with a lot of Avenue Q productions too. I know there's that like it was a Tumblr of oh, all the like the bad yeah, Avenue bad Q Avenue and those bad little shop ones too. Right. And again, like, just to kind of go back to what I was just saying. Um, you know, there's a difference between like a prop person, you know, making something or just a regular artist making something versus being a puppeteer that builds. Mm-hmm. Being mm-hmm. a builder that also performs uh, makes you such a stronger builder. And, and oh, a- building absolutely. makes you such a stronger puppeteer as well. Yeah, no, I, I think the two really work well together. And that having been a performer, when I put on a puppet that I've built, I look at it and go, oh, I don't want to use this forever. And you, you figure out how to make it as light as possible and as easy as possible and manipulative. And and then the, the vice versa and that like, well, what do I need to bring into building that I want as a performer and fight back and forth? They, they definitely constantly help each other. And I, and I guess that's something that a lot of people, I always take that for granted, that a lot of people don't both build and perform. There's a lot of friends of ours that are just performers or just builders. And <laughs> you're just no. a builder, right? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I do. No, but but even, you know, yeah, to have that, at least to understand and have an appreciation for it, too. Like, I I can, you know, do a little bit of, you know, I'm not, I'm not a great builder, but I at least have been around building enough, you know, with you, You've John. Built or stuff, with, yeah. I've built some stuff. But, you know, even just to, I've been in your workshop enough to understand, like, what the process is. I could probably talk you through building mm-hmm any of the things that you've you've done before and yet it gives you that appreciation and, and the understanding of the the puppet as an instrument or a tool um, yeah really- I was gonna say, i can go back to like uh, you know a props person building it sometimes they look stunning too right because oh, yeah, they're, they're but, but they weigh a, but they weigh 100 pounds they weigh 100 yeah. pounds or the mouth moves like like this and yeah 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 it's oh, got to be comfortable inside and out and and light and yeah well and, and that's and that's uh, it's so crucial like the the inside of the puppet is just as important as the outside of the yeah. puppet and how the mouth grip is there. It's like, Oh, what's your angle of your hand? Is your, are you bent? Is your, how's your wrist in there? What's the wrist move was all that stuff is so crucial. And it, it, yeah, like you said, the puppet can look great from the outside, but you know, immediately that the puppet is not built well, if it's not moving right all of a sudden. So it, uh, yeah. Now, uh, something I was kind of thinking about before before we got started is that, you know, I know you, you've guided us through so many things, and I know we have plenty of friends who would consider you one of one of their mentors. And you've mentioned Jim Krupa, and you've mentioned Fred Thompson, but who are some of your mentors along the way who, like, you can really point to as, like, I really, you know, I needed <laughs> them around because that they've made me who, who I am? Oh, wow. Crazy. All right. Um, well, Randy Borden for Kaiju Big Battle for sure. I learned so much about business and putting on a show through them. Uh, Randy is awesome. Randy and his brother, David, both were super amazing there. Paul Vincent Davis, who, who show place uh, artist in residence for a long time. Uh, 
has a style of puppetry named after him. <laughs> I, I know. It, it, I didn't even know that. So I, I first time I met a bunch of the Yukon grads, they were talking about PVD puppets, PVD puppets. I had never heard that term. And then I realized they were talking about Paul Vincent Davis. And I was like, wait, I hang out with him all the time. <laughs> but it was, oh, and he is so good at that glove puppet. It's just amazing. Oh, so wonderful. to get to see him work firsthand all a bunch of times. Um, and then uh, let's see other mentors. So uh, Jim Krupa, Fred Thompson, and, 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 and Pam too, Pam, Pam, Arcio. They're, they're all just, um, I, I don't know. I don't know what I did to deserve them to be nice to me, but it's, I feel so blessed that they are like that. It's great. So, yeah. And why, why should Fred Thompson come on puppeteers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this a pull for Fred? Yeah, uh, we're trying Fred. to convince him. It's a, it's a big oh, campaign. Man. That's going to be a hard one. Uh, <laughs> we're close. We're close. Dana Samborski's helping so, us out. <laughs> so, so Fred Thompson builds absolutely beautiful beautiful puppets i think he builds my favorite hands of any puppet i've seen oh, he has he has these absolutely exquisite hands that he builds and he builds in a very unique style using different uh dowels and joints jointed dowels and then fills them in and there's beautiful elongated poses and he was a dancer too if you didn't know and so i think I, both of us use the same kind of thing and that there's certain ways that your your hands go as a dancer extending and I do that with all my puppets. I'll pose the arms in different ways that are very much similar to what you would do with a, a dancer. Uh, but Fred has worked with, he, he, he is the most humble man ever in that he'll say, oh, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. <laughs> but then you look at what he's done, and you're like, this is amazing. Uh, he, he built a, like a crane for Connor. Um, uh, what was the? The, the jungle when they did the jungle they he built the crane oh. for the cow that came and grabbed it and pulled it over and he did it in like no oh, time this man. crazy levered crane uh yeah he does things yeah. i i still can't even fathom so he's great he's great and totally knows his stuff <laughs> but good luck getting fred that's all yeah. i gotta say <laughs> i think we're getting close yeah. we're getting close yeah, yeah. anytime he messages me which i love the way that he messages he messaged is i feel like i'm getting a letter from somebody when he sends uh -huh. a facebook message and every time we talk i always put it oh can't wait to have you on or, you should really come on those little nudges but yeah I, mean, I guess if you talk about one of the the biggest changes or what got me to hear is really that push from fred at that festival that says that you have to go to the o'neill He's like, you just have to. And he bugged me the rest of the year till the application time came up. He was like, no, 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 you have to, you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this every, and you just keep po poking me like, are you ready to apply? And it was, it was really awesome thing to say, you got to go do it. And, and Fred's the reason that, you know, he handpicked me to be the, the craftsman in residence or master craft, whatever the title they gave me is at the O'Neill, yeah. uh, the shop guy with uh, Ulysses, who Ulysses is fantastic too. So we run it together. And the, uh, it, it was, I guess it was that mentality that he, he likes what I, what I was talking about earlier, where I'm a hard worker uh, and, but I'm also always happy. I'm always there. I know my stuff, but I'm also always happy. So no matter what people bring to me, I'm not going to be flustered with it. And the O'Neill shop, if you haven't been there to anyone watching is absolutely crazy. And that, one second you're building, helping some people with a marionette where you're sanding feet and helping them show how to work that on a belt sander. So then you're building shadow puppets with someone else, helping them figure out the jointing of the shadow puppets. So then you're doing a glove puppet and they're like, I don't have time. It's all right. I'll make you a pattern. You'll come back in five minutes. We'll be ready. <laughs> and then you're building, uh, you know, whatever other, like, one person's like, oh, I need this flower to wilt. Can you build me a mechanism to have this flower wilt? Okay, yeah, let's do that. All right, all right, here you go. It's done. Um, yeah, you really last, become the associate producer of, like, every part of Everyone's project. <laughs> last, last year, we were building giant uh, shadow screens that were lamps out of paper and hula hoops for, for Felice's project. And every year, it's trial by fire of, what are you going to do? What's coming at me? I don't know. Okay, here we go. Let's build it. Is that good enough? All right, good. Great. Go, go, go. Go practice more. So it's it's a it's a wild show over that week. <laughs> yeah. So I, and I know you said, you know, you're so honored to work there. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, every summer working with Jim and stuff. But uh, I, I think they're also very lucky to have you as well. Because I said, oh. you know, my, no, really, because my first year going, you know, as a, especially as a first time goer, it's very intimidating to be there as well. You're with all these greats and even all these other participants that come. You look at what they're doing and their art is so amazing. And again, it is intimidating. And I was, I was like, I was like, I was so nervous to be there and stuff. And then you just came right over and just started talking to me and made me feel so comfortable comfortable and we've kind of been <laughs> friends ever since but really like if you weren't there um i don't think i really would have had as good of an experience just for how nervous i came in so i, I huh. appreciate that and thank you oh thanks Adam. i remember i even wrote it on my on my thing at the end my uh, what is that the uh, the, the evaluation the evaluation yeah. i was like oh my gosh if it wasn't for john little i was like oh my gosh i would have made it 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 didn't help that you and I spent what seven hours driving down there. Oh yeah, this I guy explained... left me high and dry. No, 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 because you kept asking me to explain things to you, and I would tell you about it, and you're like, I don't understand it. What any of this means? And it's like, yeah, you'll you'll know when you get there. And he <laughs> went off with his click, and I was on the I porch did. by I myself. <laughs> no, it, it, it's no. fun. It, it's tough. It's a tough job because it's you're you're. Yeah, you're you're in charge of safety, so you're trying to make sure that everyone doesn't get their arm cut off on the bandsaw or sand off their fingertips on the on the belt sander. Uh, but then you're also there to be guidance for every single kind of puppet thing that could come up from the staging to the design to the uh, how they moved, whatever it is. Um, and then you're also kind of a bouncer and say, "You got to go get some sleep. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. Like go, you're done in the <laughs> shop, right?" And then uh, emotional support because it is such a tough time. It is. Yeah. People are like, I just need a hug, John. Can I just get a hug? And like, yeah, I can give you a hug. All right, there you go. You're better now. I'm better now. Thank you. It's just you know you get the tearful Tuesday for puppeteers, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, they just it just I guess you just need a yeah. It's it's yeah. a crazy job. Crazy no, I, job. I think one of the best things you do is uh, it's usually Tuesday or Wednesday night of starting the Hey You uh, Real Cool <laughs> Cat uh, at the pub every, you know, just to get that morale up. Is, you know, the, yeah. need the, the, the morale booster. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Totally. Yeah. Now, uh, another distinction that you hold at the O'Neill uh, during the pre-conference uh, is sort of the keeper of the Jim Krupa puppet tears stories. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, had, uh, he had so many more he could have told in your podcast. You oh, guys got to well, get him uh, back. Got to get him back. We're, we, we have him He's already booked for a special yeah. anniversary. <laughs> show. But, uh, but before we ask you what your puppet tears story is, do you have any good, uh, a, a good Jim Krupa puppeteer story that you could uh, talk about? <laughs> Oh man, this could get me in trouble. Uh, or maybe, maybe not I should ask the... it this way: Do you have your own puppeteer story from working with Jim? Maybe I'll ask it that way. Uh, all right. So, so here's what I. I it, it's kind of. Hmm, ooh, that's a tricky call. I don't. Uh, you have to ask him. You have to ask him. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think, Yo, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I think the the close. So I had puppeteers was the the last day of the the howdy do show. We, you, you, we were work. You know, the O'Neill, you work all crazy hours. I feel like you're up basically for twenty hours a day and sleep oh, for four, yeah. and then get up and do it all over again. And I was burning the candle at both ends and burning the candle at both ends. And I went up to take a. I was like, Jim, I'm gonna go lay down, man. I'm just beat, and the show is in a couple hours. I was like, it's fine, right? I'm gonna go take a nap quick, and just I'll come back and be great. Mm -hmm. And so I went up and I took a nap, and I'm just having a great time in dreamland and then all of a sudden you know i set my phone alarm but there the reception is so bad that your phone is constantly looking for a signal and looking for a signal so it drains your battery super fast so my phone had died my phone died <laughs> and i woke up and i knew i looked out the window and i could see all these people going to the shows and like milling around like there's too many people here oh no what time is it what time is it oh no and I threw on my clothes as fast as I could. And just as I was putting them on, I got a knock on the door from the O'Neill people saying, John, they need you. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and so I'm like going sprinting down the way. And there's only one. So I'm running down the hallway. And I'm trying to get there as quick as I can. And the only person that could be there that could block me, of course, is Tyler Bunch. So Tyler <laughs> Bunch is in the hallway. The two of us cannot pass like ships in the night. 
it's not gonna happen. And so I was like, Tyler Moon. <laughs> and so I go and I sprinting now full speed down to the barn. And I and I show up there and I was like, I'm so sorry, Jim. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he's like, it's cool, man. It's fine. Jim yeah. was super awesome about it. It was all just me. It was just me being sad. And I but I live my life on the Early is on time. On time is late. Late is irresponsible. Mm-hmm. Like one of those Boy Scout things. Right. It killed. It was hurting me in my soul that I was late to this thing, and especially for this man that I totally adore and love, and he's just t- giving me such a huge responsibility to be like the main feature of his show, and here I am running in basically like eight minutes before the show is going to start, <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, yeah. And well, and wasn't how do you, the how do you do show didn't it also open the whole night's performance? Oh, the whole night, the yeah. whole night show, <laughs> absolutely. But Jim was great. He never, you know, he was like, "It's fine, we got time. You're you're okay. You're fine." He's like, "I was talking to your parents," and then I realized, "Wait a minute, where's John?" Like my parents were at the show <laughs> that I almost missed, and yeah. so, uh, oh, it was crazy. On but, the bright side, you were very well rested. And ready I was very well part. rested and ready to go. But that's just what ha- it was just. Yeah, one of those flukes where you're just crazy tired there. The oh, yeah. no battery in the phone, just perfect storm. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> but that, that's the close thing with a gym puppeteer story. <laughs> yeah. Well, and actually, before before we get into closing stuff, there's one sure. more kind of. I know we talked touched on it a little bit, but I think it'd be a, a good kind of standalone. Um, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit more of of advice that that you can give that we can give mm. about uh, for people who are trying to sell puppets. Because oh, uh, people are always asking, how much do I charge? And and I know what earlier you said, and which I think is great advice about timing yourself, especially when you're getting started off. After a while, you kind of get a feel for how long something's going to take. But yeah. timing yourself is is really, really uh, great advice. But there's also a line between making sure you're charging enough and also, I think, knowing what you're worth as well. Because sometimes I mm-hmm. see people that are very new builders. I'm not saying that they shouldn't sell their stuff, but sometimes they're overvaluing their time. Because mm-hmm. in one sense, you know, like maybe $30, $40, $50 an hour, you know, is fair for your time. But then what is your time worth at that skill level as well? So, like, how do you, for you, what was the process for, like, slowly raising your price and 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 stuff like that? Oh. Well- I, like I said before, I literally sold the first puppet for 20 bucks to my wife's boss. Like it was <laughs> literally 20 bucks. Like someone wants to buy this. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and from there you realize very quickly, Oh, I got to start jumping 20 bucks, a hundred bucks. Okay. Until the point where I think, you know, you're in demand when you're basically constantly building when you're, when you're sitting there and you got basically a project running into another project, mm-hmm. you need to really be thinking about, your time and your worth there. So, uh, but I don't know. That's a, that's a, it's a fun question, a hard question of like, really, you got to value your own time. You got to look around. I think uh, compare yourself to some other people and yeah. see what you're, you're doing. Uh, maybe even it's one of those kinds of situations where try and find someone else to puppeteer your puppet and see what they think. It could be interesting perspective too. If you get and that and that's always I like that at the O'Neill people show me puppets all the time and say, oh, you know, this is nice here, this is nice here, but you might want to think about this and uh, and then they they've just elevated their their puppet in one quick little conversation. So, but I think I think people know. I think people know where they sit, right? Yeah, where- yeah. And, and also there's there's so many different ways to do it as well. Whereas I know a lot of people, and sometimes I've done this, just um, you know. There, there's no project that really won't take at least a day, you know? Oh, so yeah. Some, some people have a day rate, you know? Or this is a two-day project. So, you know, some people go by hours. Some people go by days. At the end of the day, kind of depends on yourself and your work process as well. Like, are you are you doing this full-time, you know? Or are you only working on it like two hours a day uh, here and there and uh, things like that? Is it, do, you, do you tend to do yours as a day rate or an hourly rate or per project? Uh, I think I kind of do it per project, but I, I also know that, you know, most puppets are going to take somewhere between 60 to 80 hours, depending, I guess, on uh, what level of patterning and attention to details. And, you know, there's also the, the farming of materials. Like, don't forget that time searching for the right fur, or right fleece is all your time, too. It's not just building as yeah. well as 
all the time dealing with the client back and forth of, yeah. okay, I'm emailing them. All right. They're writing back to me. I got to wait for a response before I can move forward at all. Yeah. So, uh, and it's all those photos and check-ins and back and forths and, and payments and yeah, everything else. One thing that's helped me a lot too, and maybe I'll even, we should put this online as a document, an example of like one of my invoices that I use. Cause I really, I break it all down. Even, even the, it might not necessarily all come up in the conversation, but so it's so transparent for them to see like, like, the patterning, the hours, and the rate for that. I have, I have a different rate for my patterning time versus the building time versus you know the material costs and all that. And really breaking it down in that way, I have found helps a lot as well. Mm -hmm. They can really see exactly what they're getting and see how much work that is. And also sometimes I'll give them multiple pitches saying, "Hey, you know what? If you want, uh, depending on the design of the character, if they just want, you know, a puppet, which is oh God." That's a whole other conversation. People asking, <laughs> oh, do I want a puppet. But, but anyway, you know, like there's a certain rate for it. Like if you want a custom made puppet with a, you know, a unique design that I have to pattern, you know, it's going to cost a lot more because of that patterning time. But oh, yeah. if you want to go this route, these are some patterns and shapes I already have. You can save a little bit of money by, you know, kind of using some stock shapes that I have, mm -hmm. you know, and giving people options like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like a, a totally unique head that you're patterning from beginning to end is a lot more labor intensive and uh trying to make it all work and there's a lot more failed prototypes in there and everything else too of making sure the seams are matching and blending and everything else but yeah cool. i like i like that i actually haven't done that idea of like here's the ones i can make easily i actually like that i'm gonna steal yeah. that adam That's well good. you know because <laughs> well especially sometimes the people you know people have these grand ideas of what they want yeah i would oh, every 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 person wants an eye blink i think every oh, single oh, person oh. wants an eye yeah. blink i said do you really need an eye blink i don't know if you need an eye blink it, yeah. you yeah. know it takes a little bit of time <laughs> i'm gonna add like yeah. a lot of money to this if i'm building an eye blink and yeah. they go i, mm, I need an maybe eye i don't want to like, like piggy <laughs> Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Miss Piggy. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I try to stay away from that because, especially when I'm going to send stuff out, you know. And I know, I know, I'm very happy with, you know, as far as, um, you know, structurally how mine are. I know mine are very sound. That's what I pride myself in the most, and making sure it's something that is going to last for a long time. And sometimes I try to convince them out of that, just because I know, even though I know I'll, I'll build an iMac that'll last a long time. I mean nothing's indestructible if you drop it if it gets stepped on or smashed or something and, and and at the end of the day even if it's their fault in some way it'll be a reflection on you you know oh yeah so i try to make sure my stuff is uh you know ind indestructible as much as i can and so, sometimes you know I'll, I'll undersell it so it's like you know what i could charge a lot more if i do a mech but i don't want to <laughs> put a mech in because they're going to break it and then there's going to be it's, it's going to be a problem and i'm gonna have to fix it later i don't want to have to fix it later <laughs> Oh so gosh. so that actually reminds me of a funny story. So they, uh, I, I do the same thing. I try and build them as indestructible as I can. I don't want that puppet coming back to me. I don't want to hear that it broke on set. And it, it does happen, but I don't want to hear it, right? Yeah. And so I built this puppet for this client. This is oh, years and years ago. And I sent it off. And then I got a, a note from the – so I always like – whenever I finish a puppet, I take a bunch of photos – and then I'll usually do a quick puppeteering session with it, just kind of showing it off and showing how it works. And they'll look, all right, great. Is that good? You know, give them a little bit of taste of how you can puppeteer, which again, being able to be a good puppeteer shows off your building skills too. Cause now the puppet looks better because you've, you are both. Um, but so I sent the puppet off and I got an email back that said, the puppet's broken. It's broken. I was like, it's broken? <laughs> and it's like, what happened? Did it, did it get broke? Did it shipping? Did they crush it? Did, like, I'm like, I, I can't even think of what happened. And they're like, well, it's just not doing what you did in the video. And I was like, what <laughs> do you mean it's not doing what you did in the video? And they're like, well, I'm trying to puppeteer it up and it just, it's not being funny. It's not looking right. It's not looking the right way. It's just not, it doesn't have the same animated quality. And it's like, have you ever puppeteered before? They're like, no. And so I was like, well, that might be the problem. <laughs> it might be the problem that, <laughs> that yeah. you haven't puppeteered before. It takes a little time. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something, something that the stitching will fix. Yeah. No, I was like, I can't fix that one. Buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that but, is that ever um, part of uh, your process for um, choosing clients or, or going with a client? Because that's that is actually for me one of the things I always ask as well is uh, who's going to be performing this. 
you know, do you uh, have puppeteers? I think I think now that's much more of my, you know the real conversation because they're bigger projects of what what's this going to be? Is this a web series? Is this a TV show? Is this a a theatrical show? where it's going to be used every day of the week, seven days of the week for a bunch of shows, or is it going to be just a web series with a little offset character? And, and, and you kind of feel a little bit of that. And then, but um, yeah, I guess, I guess now you kind of sense that it's going to be a thing that really there's puppeteers being involved, but it's still, sometimes you see some horrible stuff with your puppets that you're like, wow, yeah. that's sad. <laughs> that's yeah, sad. that's what I try to avoid. Because what I see, because, you know, even, use puppeteers, people. You could, use build, them. The most, you could you build the most beautiful puppet in the world. But if it's mm -hmm. not being performed well, it makes the puppet not look as good. So all the time people ask me, you know, about about you know uh, doing custom build, and one of my first questions is also like, who's going to be puppeteering it? And if it's you know, and, and I look into the clients, you know, I find out if they are puppeteers. Oh, well, we're going to try to do. We're hoping to do it ourselves. And not, not always, but often, then I'll I'll I'll, I'll pass. I'll pass it on or. Um, you know, I just, you know, cause it's our work as well. We want it mm -hmm. to look nice. We like putting those clips in, in our videos of our portfolios or on our website. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's yeah. so important, especially, yeah. Oh my gosh. Especially now with the way the internet is, it's, it's everywhere. So that's when he sends me the commission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. Hey, I send some to Adam. So yeah, no. hey. you know, sometimes I get busy. And I'm like, Hey Adam, take this one. Take this oh, one. Adam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, because even because the one I just I did uh, with uh, Thomas Sanders with that YouTube. Uh, those are uh, great. I love those puppets. Thanks, thanks. It was such a fun build, but that was the, one of the, the first bag. Questions. I think is the, my favorite. The 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 bag. Oh was such, yeah, that was yeah. Such a different, fun. unique thing. Like I've built robotic ones. I've done a lot of the ones similar you had there, but the bag was really nice. That that's that's some experimenting there. That had to. Oh, be. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was tough. You know, that's part of why I really like that build so much. Cause it was very different from a lot of the work that people see me doing. And like you said yourself, you kind of tend to get pigeonholed. They're like, Oh, why well, we don't want to use Adam. Cause he only does this style of puppets. Like again, like you said, that's what people are buying. You know, that's what, that's what they want. That's what they asked me for. So that's what I did. You yeah. Know? Yeah. No, I mean, I have like, so like I have little tabletop guys. Let's see here, 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 here. Look, do, do, do. You know, the little guy, this is one I made for, uh, when I was down in the O'Neill shop and I was just digging through stuff and I was like, Oh, wait a minute. That could be a great puppet. And the best part is that you're, are you guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That so, great. um, but that, that's what it's about. Like, but no one's going to pay me to build those. I have to build yeah. it for myself and do my own show. Right. That's yeah. Yeah. exactly that's, yeah. Well, but, and with that paper bag, it was similar to what you had to do with the the hand to God puppets. Of that thing was indestructible. Like it looked like a a you know your run of the mill brown paper bag. Oh yeah, you can't you could not wreck that puppet. No, it's, uh, that's Tyvek paper. It looks just like a brown paper bag. I did a lot of research buying all the different types of things. At first, I was experimenting with fabrics to kind of get like a brown fabric to get that look, which wasn't too bad. But man, that that Tyvek brown paper <laughs> it looked perfect but what was strange about it because it was tyvek you can't really glue it so oh I yeah had, i had to stitch that bag together Ugh. which was weird <laughs> a weird pro but i lined it i lined it as well with mm -hmm. uh with fabric on the inside so i mean it's it's, it's pretty legit uh for, as far as uh, being a sound puppet it wasn't a throwaway thing to use uh -huh. for a day so not gonna get sweaty and yeah. yucky and so oh, yeah it, it that is the fun part of puppet building is that you never know what you're going to get. Are you going to be creating basically a, a, a possessed toaster? Are you going to have to like make a toaster that can be puppeteered? Can, are you going to do little cockroaches like I see behind you? Uh, or are those fleas or cockroaches? Fleas. 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 So the, the fleas behind you, 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 because of the world of puppeteering, anything can become alive. You really never know what you're going to get. You have to be kind of ready for it. So... Well, uh, you know, John, as we begin to wrap up, we'll ask oh, no. <laughs> uh, all of our guests, besides the, the story you already told, which was great. But do you have a favorite puppeteers story from your, your journey uh, through through this crazy little world of ours? Uh, so you were you were talking about the little shop of horrors so that I oh, yeah. built some right. And that uh, that came about from Roxy Myron was doing a kind of kids Halloween show 
for like a just you know so this is a free freebie thing i was doing for fun and she wanted to make the entire show place into a spooky but really kind of more just outrageous show not really scary but just fun spectacle and you want to make the whole thing a train station and so she's like john can you bring something fun for this and i was like oh yeah yeah i'll do something and it rang in my head that i was like oh little shop of horrors but i'll change it to little's shop of florals and so <laughs> totally dumb but a bad pun and so little's like apostrophe s right like my name and so i built a bunch of fun plants and uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is a, can you see the, Oh yeah, little cactus right here. So yeah. he he was one of those guys I built for that, and then uh, I built some Audrey twos because I thought it'd be really fun to have the fake arm Audrey number two, and I had that one. It was great, and then I was like, I need something bigger, something really. They gave me a big space. I needed something big, so I built. I don't know, in like a week, built the entire Audrey two number three. The, so oh, the pod wow. three and it was a huge you know, it was like the size of me basically so a whole person could be in there I built the root legs and the whole thing and i had to get it in place and check it out and then what happened was i was like it's not done yet i gotta bring it back to my shop it was, it was really in a week kind of time frame and so i'm bringing it i brought it home and it had to be done the next day and so i'm all night long just working you don't realize how many leaves something like that needs to cover that body and i had stitched a bunch and fit really fancy ones for all near the top of it but there was a bunch that need to be filled out for the bottom so at midnight one in the morning i'm sitting there hot gluing them at this point like it just needs to be done and there's thousands and thousands of leaves and i'm reaching inside so my whole body's inside this thing because so big trying to like glue up all these leaves over and over and over and over again and layering them all so they look nice when they're all done and must have been two in the morning. I got one of those beats of the high temp hot glue gun right on my fingertips. And my fingers swelled up so big. It looked like E.T. Like, you know, like E.T. when he's like, oh, phone home. Yeah. <laughs> it swelled up like that. And but I still have to finish this thing and it's not done. So I ran under cold water and I'm trying to deal with the burn. And then I was like, take it out from under cold water. Immediately hurts. Immediately hurts. So I then grabbed ice from my freezer. I'm holding ice in my hand and then I had to go back and keep gluing. And so as the ice melted, I got new ice and I kept going all night. Just well, <laughs> and luckily the next day I had to perform the next day as part of the show with the Audrey two, but uh, with the, the number two illusion, right. With the fake arm. But luckily I had rigged in that one to have planters, uh, like gloves, like gardening gloves. Uh -huh. So it hid all the like giant gross fingers. Oh, so bad. But it is one of those things. It just happens. Like, but you just got to keep working, right? It's just, oh, sure. God, it hurt for so long. So long. <laughs> Biggest awful blister you can imagine. Because if you ever, use, I don't know if you ever use a high temp hot glue gun, man, oh, those things are yeah. hot, hot. Oh, yeah. So, when, when we were uh, doing, uh, Mark, marty robinson's halloween show uh the first time at the o'neill we were doing some of that high temp stuff on uh, the, <laughs> the, the jack pumpkin thing i don't think i did i think maybe ann sweetman or mindy uh ended up getting burnt one day and it was oh. just oh you're yeah. it's bad it's oh. bad but so yeah as a rule now i don't glue after midnight anymore right. well, i don't i use my, i don't use much hot glue anyway mostly sure. you know barge and stuff but for as a general, I don't I don't hot glue after midnight, so oh, it's just a new rule now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So you want you want a crazy behind the scenes extra little thing? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you know that giant Audrey two number three I made. Yeah. So I tried to give that away to somebody. Like just I didn't even. It's just take. It's so big, right? Yeah. I just tried to give it away, and. Every place that contacted me that said they wanted it was like on the other coast. They're all on the West Coast. I was like, I'm not shipping this <laughs> over there. It's like, it's to crate the thing. And it was like, it's not happening. So I ended up leaving it at the Goodwill in town. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't throw it away. And so I was like, I'm just going to leave this at the Goodwill. So I left it at the Goodwill. And they they had it like kind of in there for a while, but the whole thing there's a whole Audrey two number three right for anyone that wanted. <laughs> oh my! I can't believe they brought it in too. I'm like, oh my gosh! I brought it in. I, I dropped it in the pile and kind of just like 
yeah. sneaking it out like did you, you buy it back? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, how much were they selling it for? Do you remember? Yeah, or did it sell? How, how would they even price that? Even... I don't know. I don't know. I didn't go back to check, but they had it. So <laughs> hysterical. <laughs> Good roll the giant Audrey. <laughs> oh my god. Where are the other ones? Yeah. The 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 uh so I'm sure you have this happen, Adam, where puppets just disappear. Like you sell them and then you never see them again oh, ever. Yeah. Right. So the Audrey two number two, the one with the fake arm, I same thing. I was just trying to get rid of it. It's like, I don't need this anymore. And some guy bought it in Texas. Right. And so that was years and years ago, like maybe seven years ago. And I was just scrolling through my Instagram feed. And then I see Steve Whitmire's feed and there's a picture of a guy with an Audrey 2 number 2 with him in the picture. I was like, that's the one I made. Oh my God. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I made that puppet. Yeah. That, that's so funny. Oh, yeah, I, lo- I love, uh, sometimes it's like, it's like, I imagine it's like watching your children grow up. You know, mm-hmm. seeing them do something like, I got that one that's doing really well on YouTube, that other mm-hmm. Arlo monster that's got his own gaming <laughs> It's really fun to fun to watch every once in a while, but yeah, there's so many you just never saw again. And I've I even like a year later emailed them like, "Hey, you know, if you're doing anything, I'd love to promote it or see see what you're just doing with it because it's kind of cool." Uh, but almost never do I ever. <laughs> well, I have so many out there. I have no idea. People who sell them again? That's, oh, that's, that breaks that my heart. Breaks my heart. <laughs> that breaks my heart, especially when they sell them for higher than I sold them to them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah. Oh no! So, uh, so what's the best way for people to follow you to find out what other projects you're working on? And oh yeah, like uh, well, I have my web page that I just kind of gave a quick update to. So that's littlescreatures.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at littlescreatures, Twitter at littlescreatures, Facebook at littlescreatures. It's a little theme there. Uh, so all, all one word, that, all so, one word. Yeah. It's all this L I T L uh, uh, L I T T L E S creatures and yeah. So no apostrophe in the because they don't do that for web stuff. So right. yeah, I remember when I first saw your logo or something, I was like, "Little Puppet." I'm like, "Why would you do that?" Like you're pigeon. Because it's my name, man. You're pigeonholing <laughs> yourself and just making little puppets. Like, what if someone wants a bigger puppet? And then I met you. I'm like, "Oh my god, this is name. That's actually the best name for a company, <laughs> Little Puppet." And he's so big. And he's and he's like, like, ah, <laughs> irony. Uh, people ask me all the time, did you change your name? And oh, yeah. yeah. I remember the, the first time I met David Bizarro, he was at, I asked him, I was like, so did you change your name? He's like, no, I was going to ask you the same question. Like, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's one of those just happy coincidences. It works great for mm-hmm. like, well, why wouldn't you name your puppet? company after yourself (laughs) so right (laughs) well john little thank you so much for joining us on puppet tears and uh we hope to be able to see and hang out with you soon yeah absolutely thanks guys future too so maybe next time we'll do it in person yeah yeah that'd be great yeah very cool we'll talk soon Bye. bye many thanks to our newest patreon patrons Lori everett melissa rodler craig shakuri and H. Greenberg. Visit puppeteers.com slash Patreon to pledge your support today or make a one-time donation on our website. Thanks so much for watching and listening each week.